Welcome to our talk on Indian and Islamic arms and armor. I'm Yifan Lee, the publisher and editor of Orientations Magazine. We have been partnering on art lectures with Asia Society in Hong Kong for a number of years. Today, we are pleased to launch a new iteration of the talk series, which we call the Orientations Art Circle at Asia Society. With this, we will mark the publication of each issue of Orientations by inviting contributors included in that issue to share the latest research from their articles. The March-April 2021 issue was released last week and included two articles on Islamic and Indian arms and armor. The first, written by Joachim Meyer, discusses objects in a new exhibition, exhibition opening at the David Collection in Copenhagen, titled Fighting, Hunting, Impressing, Arms and Armor from the Islamic World, 1500 to 1850. Joachim is curator at the David Collection. The second article is written by Rachel Parikh, who is assistant curator of Asian and Middle Eastern art at Wooster Art Museum. Her article looks at the role of animals in South Asian arms and armor. We will begin with each of the authors who would take us through highlights from their papers. I will ask Joachim to begin first. Hello. And first of all, thank you, Yifan, for inviting me for this talk. It's so, sorry. And I have prepared a PowerPoint. If I can make it work, here it starts. Okay. My museum, the David Collection, possesses some important pieces of Islamic arms and armor. <clears throat> they were acquired with the intention of integrating them with other objects in the museum with similar aesthetics, since we tried to present a comprehensive picture of the art of the Islamic world. In other words, we have not been focusing particularly on weapons up to now. On the other hand, luckily there's a Danish private collector who's been focusing on Islamic arms and armor in particular. And as it turns out, he was quite happy to lend us many of his precious pieces for an exhibition on this subject. Both my museum's objects and those belonging to the private collection do not have very old provenances. But in Denmark, we have another institution with objects with an older Danish history. The National Museum in Denmark holds Islamic arms and armor with uh, an old Danish history that go back to the Danish kings in the 17th century. So gathering pieces from these three Danish collections, we've been able to form an exhibition that we hope will give a rather representative picture of Islamic weapons from around 1500 to 1850 as regards to the many different types, the different uses, the different aesthetics and particularities such as their many inscriptions and also how they were collected. The main focus of the exhibition are three themes related to use in warfare, on the hunt, and the more peaceful circumstances as precious objects carried in public by the upper classes in the Islamic societies as a kind of male jewelry exchanged as precious gifts or enjoyed by their owner in private. One of the ways to contextualize the arms and armor in the exhibition is through paintings, some contemporary with the objects, but others from different periods and areas that nonetheless still show how the arms and armor were used. In this way, the paintings illustrate how many customs were common for different Islamic dynasties and periods in a tradition that continued until modern times. I hope that this will also be apparent from the following examples of objects from the exhibition. To start with, I will show you this illustration from 1493 to 94 from a Shahnama manuscript showing numerous examples of arms and armor typical of Islamic armies just before firearms had their real breakthrough. Here we find many objects, uh, many types of objects that we also exhibit. You see lances, uh, bows with arrows here, Sabers, you see them here, for instance, and a single axe here. The protective equipment consists of helmets, coats of mail, and armed defenses. 
One horse is equipped with a champron and caparison. A large red flag is flown at the top, and in the middle of the top is a standard crowned by the legend Allah here in reverse, and a hanging resembling a horse's tail. <clears throat> Such tails are also suspended from the horse's necks. Horsetail ornaments were a distinctive trait of the Eurasian mounted nomad people used by Turks and Mongols and their successors. Among the Ottomans, they were a symbol of rank and dignity. <clears throat> Standards with horse tails accompanied important military commanders when on the move and would be lined up in front of their tents. A great deal of symbolic significance is associated with the conquest of standards, and horsetail standards were coveted booty in the battles fought against the Ottoman armies in the second half of the 17th century in Central Europe. A standard in the National Museum of Denmark undoubtedly hails from there, but how it arrived in Denmark is not known. Originally mounted on a rod, the standard terminates in a spherical final of gilt copper. Below this dyed horsehair of sh different shapes and lengths is mounted, some sticking up and some trailing downwards. Long braids of horsehair also adorn the piece and on the central wooden rod, horsehair forms a geometric pattern like woven fabric. The helmets appearing in the painting with characteristic arch openings above the eyes are known as turban helmets. The term refers partly to their shape and partly to the fact that these relatively large helmets were worn on top of stock absorbing turbans. Such helmets are thought to have been used especially by the Turkmen in Western Iran and Eastern Anatolia in the 15th century, but may also have been worn by the Ottomans a little later. As the painting shows, chainmail aventails could be attached to the front of the, of the helmets. You see them here. In more peaceful situations, this covering could be lifted up behind the sliding, sliding nestle. During combat, it would be let down to completely protect the face, leaving only holes in front of the eyes. A turban helmet in the David collection, which, which also has holes used to attach mail, has a fluted pattern at the transition from the cylindrical lower part. In addition, it is decorated with two bands of larger inscriptions praising an unnamed ruler. A dating and context for this helmet can be established through a very similar turban helmet in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It carries closely related inscriptions that give the name of the Turkmen Akuyunlu Sultan who ruled in Western Iran from 1478 to 1490. The blade of a beautiful dagger in the exhibition, exhibition belonging to the private collector is adorned with a Persian text playing on the parallel between the deadly weapon and the beloved who strikes with all consuming, all destroying love. The dagger belongs to a small group of related exquisitely worked blades, which in addition to gold inlay also feature raised ornamental sections and perforations. A single dagger from this group in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul formerly belonged to the Ottoman Sultan Selim I. Its rock crystal hilt bears inscriptions that in addition to the words conquest of Persia gives the year 1514 of the important battle of Chaldiran in which the Ottoman army led by Sultan, Sultan Selim defeated the Safavid army in Iran. During this period, the Ottoman court was strongly influenced by the Safavids, its Safavid counterpart in Iran, and Iranian artists were forcibly relocated to the Sultan's workshops in Istanbul in the wake of the victory of Chaldiran. Despite the Persian text, it is thus very likely that this exquisite dark blade with its gold inlay was made in Turkey, not least because the designs include the feather like sass leaves that became widespread that became a widespread form of decoration in the Ottoman empires from the 1520s and onwards. Another very important dagger in the exhibition is this one that belongs to my museum. It's a complex sculptural masterpiece. On one side, 
the necks of a phoenix and a dragon are entwined and the creature is locked in a deadly battle. Opposite, a fantastic lion with horns holds a small elephant in, in its outstretched claws. The rest of the dragon's and lion's bodies run along the handle and, upon reaching the guards, merge with two birds with their wings outstretched and heads turned down towards the blade. The animal's eyes were originally inlaid with rubies, but almost all of which are missing today. There exists today a small group of related daggers with these complex sculptural hilts, four, five or six of them, and some made in this flashy materials, but this one seems to be one of the finest worthy of a ruler. And in fact, a painting also in the David collection depicts this dagger or one very similar to it in the belt of Ali Adel Shah I, the Sultan of Bijapur in the Deccan in India, where he ruled from 1580 to 1558, 15, sorry, from 1558 to 1580, thus offering a unique testimony to the dagger's geographical, chronological, and also social context. How the dagger ended up so prominently in his belt has been discussed along with its particular mixture of both Hindu and Muslim iconography. Bijapur was one of the five minor Deccan sultanates in southern India who were largely Shia and had good contacts with Iran that was equally Shia. On the other hand, these sultanates were often in con conflict with each other and with their neighbors, both the mighty one to the north, the Mughals, and to the south, the Hindu kingdom of Vijayanagara. Since ancient times, the Islamic world had a highly developed system of gift giving, one in which weapons also played an important role. Gifts were exchanged not only between rulers and their subjects, but also between rulers themselves, and gifts of arms also reached beyond the Islamic world. For example, a yatagan arrived in Denmark this way. Such a short sword were typical of the Ottoman territories where magnificent versions were made for the sultans in the 16th century. However, the type gained its greatest popularity in the 18th and 19th centuries in the Balkans and around the Mediterranean. With its hilt and scabbard fittings of gold sheet and rich gold decoration on the blade, this yet again is a good example of the type of weapon used as gifts, both locally and to rulers abroad in the so-called Barbary states in Northern Africa in the 18th century and the first decades of the 19th. It was a gift from the ruler of Tunisia, Ali I, Ibn Muhammad, to the Danish King Friedrich V, and it arrived in Copenhagen in 1753. The gift sealed a peace treaty between Denmark and Tunisia to end the threat from pirates attacking Danish ships in the Mediterranean, which not only seized cargoes and ships, but also took crews captive as slaves who would be ransomed. <clears throat> While it is unlikely that anyone in Copenhagen was able to read the inscriptions on the blade, it is nevertheless relevant for the situation. It's a verse relating how the blade has slacked its thirst for blood. Finally, an act in the National Museum of Denmark. It's perhaps not the most spectacular, spectacular object in the exhibition, but on the other hand, it's a remarkable testimony to the continuity of some of the traditions regarding arms and armor in the Islamic world. The axe was collected by the Danish explorer Ole Olofsson on one of his expeditions to Central Asia in the second half of the 1890s. According to Olofsson's records, the axe came from the Emir of Bukhara's court. Decorated with a scale lake pattern of turquoises, according to Olofsson, the axe had been carried by one of the Emir's chief officers at the forefront of the procession that accompanied the Emir whenever he left his residence. The use of ceremonial axes appears to have reached the Middle East, the Islamic Middle East, by way of inspiration from the Byzantine emperors 
who retained fearsome axe-carrying bodyguards with Scandinavian guards among their favorites. From here, the tradition spread to the entire Islamic world from Iran to India. These axe-carrying companions also wore bells so that the procession could be heard moving and long hats were often part of the ensemble. And here to the left, you have an axe bearer from the Shahnameh painting I showed in the beginning. And you can actually see the bells hanging from the belt and his long hats, hat, particular hat here. By the time Olufsen traveled in Central Asia towards 1900, the Bukhara Emirate had become a Russian protectorate and the Russians had began a process of modernization. The axe must have been made some generations earlier and the sale of it to Olufsen reveals how past systems of rule and old customs were now being rapidly cleared away. And finally, you can, I would mention that you can read more about these objects and all the 151 objects in the exhibition in our exhibition catalog, which is fortunately not also published in English. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, Joachim. Um, I know the exhibition is supposed to start later this month, but you just mentioned that the lock, there's still a lockdown in Denmark, so hopefully it'll open soon, and that'll run for longer than, than the September timeline. Um, Rachel, would you like to walk us through your paper as well? Absolutely. Joachim, do you mind if I uh, share my screen? I'm really excited about no, your no, exhibition. No, no, I'm, 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 tr I'm trying to close <laughs> oh, no my worries. screen, sorry. Stop, sorry, no, I... no okay, worries. sorry. Okay. No, don't worry about it. I'm very excited about your exhibition. Well, Ifan, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I just want to thank Orientations Magazine and Asia Society Hong Kong. And I do want to thank um, Simon Metcalf, the Queen's Armorer, and Francesca Levy, the Arms and Armor Conservator, both at the Royal Collection Trust for their help and expertise. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. And... It is well known that animals play a vast and intricate role in the creation of arms and armor. Their incorporation into the decorative program of these objects signified forms of power and other virtues. Their natural def defense mechanisms inspired the function of armor and different types of weaponry. And in many instances, their physical features from scales to tough skins were also exploited in the creation of these materials. However, there is not much scholarship on analyzing the ways in which animals have had an impact on this field, particularly with regard to power, trade, wealth, and even combat. My article examines the various ways in which animals literally and figuratively influence the decoration, form, and function of arms and armor in South Asia. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to briefly run through some examples that are discussed further in my article. One of the most distinct types of animal representation in South Asian arms and armor concerns the pommel, the end of the hilt of a sword or dagger. At both the Hindu and Muslim courts, the traditional rounded knob can be found replaced by an animal head. This was an especially popular practice amongst the Mughals who comprised the greatest Indo-Islamic dynasty to rule South Asia. At court, Mughal royalty and nobility carried daggers to represent their rank, wealth, and proximity to the ruler. Daggers with hilts that featured animal head pommels augmented the wielder's lofty status as they were typically made of precious materials such as jade or nephrite and embellished with gold, silver, and gems such as diamonds, emeralds, rubies, and spinels. Additionally, the animals featured the horse, ram, goat, lion, tiger, elephant, and camel were interpreted as symbols of power conveying ferocity, strength, intelligence, resourcefulness, and resilience. Demonstrating these virtues was both strategic and paramount to Mughal identity and rule. The Mughal dynasty was founded in 1526 by Babur, a Central Asian prince that was the direct descendant of Genghis Khan and Timur, the great Turco-Mongol conqueror who founded the Timurid dynasty in 1370. 
Being foreign rulers to South Asia, the Mughals used their formidable lineage to establish their legitimacy and demonstrated it through a variety of methods, the most significant being the adaptation of Central Asian and Persian royal customs, practices, and symbols. According to Salam Kauchki, daggers with animal head pommel seem to be an example of this, as these weapons were, quote, inspired by earlier models and arose from the Mughals' interests in the art and customs of their Central Asian ancestors, end quote. While maintaining this tradition, the Mughals also incorporated other animals into this practice that carried greater significance than just symbolizing general forms of power. For instance, although not as common as the horse or ram, there are extant daggers featuring the Nilgai or blue bull, a large bluish gray antelope native to South Asia. This exquisite example conveys a great sense of naturalism and understanding of the animal from the pricked up ears to the alert eyes, which is no small feat to achieve in nephrite, a really difficult hard stone to carve. The dagger was produced in the 17th century, a time when Mughal artists were noted for their natural history depictions, which demonstrated their meticulous attention to detail, scientific accuracy, and knowledge of the natural world. Artists like the great painter Ustad Mansour were commissioned to create depictions of natural history as a means to document and understand the flora and fauna of the Mughals' new and expanding kingdom, another maneuver to demonstrate Mughal control. The Nagai dagger then can be interpreted as a symbol of Mughal supremacy over South Asia's terrain through their knowledge of the land and its wildlife. Animal power is also embodied in a literal sense as natural defense mechanisms shape the construction and function of South Asian arms and armor. There are two weapons, both of which are intended to be hidden or concealed that are prime examples of this. The first is known as the Bagnak or tiger claw in Hindi, termed as such because it mimics the shape and function of the feline's powerful claws. It's a slashing weapon intended to wound or maim rather than to kill. And the bagnuk is made of either steel or iron and consists of three to five sharp curved blades that are attached to a crossbar. At both ends of the crossbar are holes through which the thumb and pinky fit so that the blades are concealed in the palm with each finger resting over the blade. The bagnuk was used by Nihang Sikhs who wore and continued to wear it in their turbans and it was also used by wrestlers in a form of fighting known as nakika kusti or claw wrestling. The second weapon and one that is actually often combined with a bagnuk is the bichwa which literally translates from Hindi to scorpion sting as the narrow recurve blade resembles this. The South Indian weapon's small size made it easy to conceal in one sleeve or waistband, while its looped handle fits snugly around the palm, enabling one to wield it without having to drop the dagger when, for example, grappling an opponent. Although utilitarian in nature, ceremonial bichwa were also produced, embellished with ornately carved and pierced decoration, as seen here. The looped handle in this example bears a large yali, a lion-like creature of Hindu mythology. They're seen as guardians as they commonly decorate entrances to temples, particularly in South India. The virtuosity and skill of the artisan is demonstrated through the combination of the weapon produced from a single piece of steel and the intricate delicate decorative program, which is only further augmented by impressive details such as the Yali's movable tongue. And you can also see traces of gold gilt. So the entire weapon would have been gilt and gold, which makes it even more impressive. The influence of animals' natural defenses on South Asian arms and armor also extended beyond inspiration to be exploited into literal use. The most popular animal materials found comprising whole or parts of weaponry and armor are hide and horn. The former was commonly used in the creation of shields. Made of buffalo, rhinoceros, or even crocodile hides, these shields ranged in use from ceremonial to utilitarian. Now on the screen is a rhinoceros hide shield that is lacquered in black and painted with four vignettes that each feature large golden lions, three of which are engaged in combat with either a boar, a goat, or a mythical creature. Although intended as courtly regalia, the shield's sumptuous decoration is actually a reflection of the original intended use of such shields, which was to protect during the hunt. Hunting shields commonly made of either buffalo or rhinoceros hide are notable for their amber color and especially for their translucency and being light in weight, which did not deter from its durability as these shields can withstand the impact of arrows and swords. And here on the screen, you can see how translucent this hunting shield made of rhinoceros hide is with the light emanating from behind it. 
A rather unusual weapon that is comprised of deer horn or more specifically the Indian black buck is the maduvu, which is also known as madu or maru. It typically consists of two black buck horns pointing in opposite directions and are connected with a crossbar that acts as a grip. It is used in close combat as primarily a defensive weapon in Silambam, an ancient Indian martial arts practice originating in Tamil Nadu around 300 BC. The wielder strives to take a lower position than his opponent in order to protect the vital parts of the body, performing stances that are even based on animal movements, such as the frog, snake, mouse, and tiger. 19th century variations of this ancient weapon can feature steel tip points. This example on the screen features gold tip points, and they can even have a small shield covering the grip. The cost of animal materials like precious gems and stones depended on a variety of factors, but mostly on availability, difficulty of procurement, and if applicable from where it was being imported. Thus, the use of certain animal materials in the creation of arms and armor was seen as a form of luxury. Arguably, the most striking example of this is the scale armor jacket seen here from the Royal Collection Trust. Scale armor has been a popular type of defense for warriors and horses throughout different cultures and time periods and are traditionally made of steel, iron, leather, rawhide, or bronze. However, this jacket employs and adapts the Indian pangolin or scaly anteater's dermal armor to create a protective garment for the wearer. Each pangolin scale has been individually painted with gold flowers and with some embe embellished further with inlaid turquoise and ruby. Although it remains uncertain, Simon Metcalf, the Queen's Armor at the Royal Collection Trust, believes that approximately eight to 10 pangolins were used to create the jacket, which was made exclusively for King Edward VII when Prince of Wales and given to him during his tour of India from 1875 to 1876 by Bhavani Singh Maharaja Dattia. While this example was intended to be ceremonial, another pangolin scale jacket in the collection could have been used in battle as the larger scales are strategically placed to protect more vulnerable parts of the body. According to Metcalf and Francesca Levy, arms and armor conservator at the Royal Collection Trust, the scales have been sewn onto textile padded coats using a plant material cord through three to four holes that were individually hand drilled into each scale. And when you think about how many scales are used, this is absolutely no small feat. The fabrication of the coats, both produced around the same time in the 19th century, signify that the maker or makers knew and understood the construction of scale armor, which was produced in India in steel or an iron form for warfare. Another example of animal material that was considered an item of luxury is walrus ivory, which came to North India from Russia by way of Iran and through Arab and Chinese trade. While elephant ivory was unsurprisingly used in South Asian arms from edge weapons to firearms, its walrus counterpart was sought for its rarity, unique, uniqueness, and its magical properties. It was believed that it had the power to reverse the effects of poison and to heal wounds, which made it a desirable material for weapons. Due to its proximity to Iran, walrus ivory was almost exclusively used in North India in artistic centers like Lucknow for hilts and grips for daggers and swords. And it should be mentioned that elephant and walrus ivory do have structural differences that depending on how they're cut can actually be visible. In general, elephant ivory has a polished look while walrus ivory has this mottled, marbled fat-like appearance, which you can see here in this hilt. And what's really interesting is that when I was talking to Francesca Levy about walrus and elephant ivory, she had mentioned that elephant ivory was sometimes pecked to imitate that mottled, marbled fat appearance of walrus ivory. And that actually brings me to my final theme. When animal materials were too costly or inaccessible, artisans employed ingenious techniques to transform other materials to imitate them. This katar, a punch dagger that is native to South Asia, has a wooden sheath covered in a green textured material that seems to be mimicking shagreen, a type of rawhide commonly associated with Japanese practices of using shark or stingray skin and is just distinguished by striking circular pattern when created when the calcified papillae are reduced to equal height and the uniform surface through polishing. Shagreen is commonly dyed, the most popular color being green as seen here. However, the term shagreen is also applied to a rawhide from horse or donkey skin used in Asiatic Russia, Turkey, Iran, and some parts of the Middle East. While it was far less common in South Asia, the Qatar sheath represents this process. After the horse or donkey hide is soaked and scraped clean, it is stretched onto a frame. 
The still moist and pliant hide was then strewn with smooth hard seeds, either from black mustard or goose foot plants. An intermediary layer, usually felt, was then laid on top of the seeds, which were then forced into the hide with a press or by the weight of someone treading upon them. And after a few days of drying out, the seeds were taken and shaken off, leaving a hardened textured surface to the hide. It remains unclear whether this process initially began as a response to create imitation shark or ray skin chagrin, or if it was born out of its own tradition. However, in the case of this Qatar sheath, the fact that it has been dyed green actually indicates that it was indeed meant to imitate its Japanese counterpart by appearing as if the hide belonged to an exotic creature of the sea. And also a lot of examples that come from Iran in the Middle East, you could see that raised embossed look that was left by the seeds. And here you can see on the left that it actually has been smoothed out to create that um, effect of Japanese chagrin. The themes, animal symbolism, forms and materials from common to luxurious to imitation briefly described here and further outlined in my article are just some of the ways in which animals have inspired and shaped South Asian arms and armor. In conjunction with the objects discussed, they shed light on how the figurative and literal use of animals signify power, wealth, trade, cultural exchange, as well as how they impacted combat. These deeper meanings and implications have commonly been overlooked in scholarship, and I hope that my article, which is intended to serve as an introduction to this vast and clearly multifaceted subject, inspires further inquiry into the might of the menagerie. Thank you. Rachel, thank you for your presentation. Um, what always amazes me about Arms and Armor is the variety of objects and the motives and the, the materials that they use. It seems to be endless. And I'm sure you, both of you just touched on a small um, section of Arms and Armor. Um, my first question to both of you would be um, the significance of inscriptions on Arms and Armor. Um, Joachim, um, one of the daggers that was illustrated in your article um, you mentioned it as well. I'm not sure if you, you, you can easily bring up that image, but this is the one that you showed. Yes. Displayed with the ivory <laughs> can, camel. Yeah. Um, so shall I try to bring it up? Yes, sure. So you described um, that it, you described it as being inscribed to the Persian text playing on the parallel between the weapon and the beloved who strikes with all consuming, all destroying love. Could you talk yes. about who is the beloved in this context? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, um, I mean, in general, what is characteristic about Islamic arms and armor, from my point of view is that they, many of them carry inscriptions and uh, they can be different kinds of inscriptions dealing with, uh, for instance, citations from the Quran or other religious texts that somehow are thought to have a, an, um, carry an, a meaning as an amulet to protect the, the carrier of the arm. But uh, you also have these uh, poetic phrases on arms and armor, which can seem strange poetic uh, phrases that relate to love on a deadly weapon. Um, and, and sometimes, which I think is also quite remarkable in, in, the, in the case of the Yatagan, which I mentioned earlier on, it's as if the weapon itself is talking, it's saying, I have stopped my thirst for blood, so I'm, I'm uh, peaceful now. And, and I think this is amazing how texts are used on weapons, or, but that's also perhaps a general character of, of Islamic art. I mean, you see texts on buildings, you see them on uh, utensils, you see them everywhere. And this is, I think text and calligraphy has a very special meaning and significance in, in uh, Islamic art. But in this particular context, uh, you have, you have uh, a text relating to somebody uh, 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 interested in his beloved, and this is, you can compare to uh, Sufi texts. You have Sufi poets like uh, Misami or Saadi that constantly talk about love and the beloved. It can also often be one man who is interested in another man, even in a young man. And uh, in a way it's, it's 
it should be interpreted not as physical love, but as spiritual love. And the beloved is somehow an image of God. So it, it's, it's, it's mystical love, the love of the, of the mystic who seeks God and seeks the spirituality. And uh, seeking God, uh, you can get destroyed. You can lose your physical uh, character. So that's the sense of it. And which is especially appropriate, of course, when you talk, uh, when, we're, when you're dealing with weapons. So this is, I mean, how I interpret it in this, in this connection. So would, would many of the weapons that you find as Islamic ones bear inscriptions? Yes, I think it's, it's, it's very usual that you find inscriptions and they can also be extremely helpful in uh, dating the work, the objects or, or finding their context because many of them carry inscriptions that uh, state uh, where they were made, who made them, who owned them and also give a date. And in the case of, uh, I mean, you, you have many famous uh, swordsmiths, for instance, and you will find their names appearing again and again. And in some cases, uh, these names, you can, you can say that they, they, you can trust the names, but in other cases, it's kind of a, a brand that has been uh, copied and uh, misused to become a fake so, I mean, if you have a famous swordsmith and you hundred years later produce a sword, you can write his name, the, the name of the famous swordsmith on it, and maybe uh, you can sell it at a good price. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of misuse of a, of a brand, I think. But I think the, the uh, Islamic arms and armor through their inscriptions carry many, many interesting uh, information. So, um, Rachel, could you talk about some of the objects that you have come across with inscriptions and do they carry the same meaning or is it more of an Islamic trait or did it carry over to Hindu, uh, weapons that are more um, from the Hindu tr tradition? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, like Joachim said, these inscriptions can have a lot of different types of significance and that both Hindu and Muslim courts in South Asia, you do find inscriptions, although it's a lot more rare um, in comparison to, for example, its European counterparts. So as Yuki mentioned, you do um, get the name of the maker or the bladesmith, gunsmith, or even the mark of an armorer. But because there's so little information to sometimes go off of with South Asian arms and armor, it's very hard to pinpoint if it's a mark, for example, who it actually belonged to. And so when we come across these um, signatures of the artisan, it's actually a, a really great thing. And dates as well. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. The most popular inscriptions that I've come across are religious in nature. And yes, as Joachim said, um, the Quran is a very popular uh, resource for Hindu material. You get hymns, you also get shlokas or verses from uh, Hindu epics and texts. And then there are uh, opportunities where you get inscriptions that give you insight into the history or the historic provenance or the movement of an object. And I'll give you an example. I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, I stop. One moment. So here I have a um, male, a shirt of mail and plate that was produced in the Deccan, so central South India. And Yoki mentioned the Deccan in his fantastic presentation. And this example has an, a Hindi inscription that mentions Maharaja Nup Singh of Bikanir, which is located in Rajasthan and a date of 1691. And you're thinking, you know, how did the name of this gentleman from uh, Rajasthan, so North India, appears on this Central South Asian um, uh, armor? And it's because Maharaja Nup Singh was a general for the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb and led a number of military campaigns in the Deccan in the 17th century. And he often took uh, weapons as well as armor as war booty had them inscribed and they were then became part of the Bikinia Royal Armory. So you do come across inscriptions like this that really give you insight into the movement of these objects. And as 
Joachim said, these inscriptions can help you understand more about the object, who created them, why they were created, when they were created, what was the intention behind it, and also who owned it in, and if it exchanged hands. So the inscriptions are, I think, my favorite thing because they really help you understand the material and sometimes, especially with South Asian arms and armor um, as a whole. So um, many of these weapons are made of precious materials. Um, could these pieces be used practically? Can you discuss their ceremonial and ritual aspects? I, I mean, making the exhibition, I, I'm sure also, Rachel, you handled objects, uh, arms and armor like these objects and, and daggers and so on. And they are, you, you actually have to take care not to cut yourself. Yes. Although they yeah. are beautiful objects adorned with uh, precious jewels, uh, they are actually quite frightening and can be used as, as real arms and armor. So That's not, not to say that they were meant to be used, but it's, I think you should think of them like somehow kind of like a modern male watches, yeah, exactly. that were like a Rolex that would also have many different uh, re refined mechanics inside. You can use them for diving, going hundreds of meters down below sea level. But would you do it? No, but it's nice to know that if you had the opportunity, you could use them. <laughs> yes. So the correct way to think about arms and armor is to think of them as male watches now. Like in a kind of male jewels, yeah. I think. Male jewelry. Of course, yeah. of course we, we, are, we are talking about jewels of a certain level. I mean, the jewels, yeah. are not, sorry, the, the weapons used by the upper strata of the, of the Islamic societies. So, so these jewels were not meant to be used. These uh, weapons were not meant to be used by their owners, I'm sure. They were, they were carriers of status and should be shown off. So that's the ceremonial and ritual aspect to well, like... I mean, they, they can be used in many different ways. I mean, one, one thing that I also found very interesting studying uh, the Islamic arms and armor were how they were exchanged as gifts. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a highly developed uh, tradition of, of uh, giving in the Islamic culture uh, on many different occasions. Uh, there, are, there are good occasions to give presents to to, uh, from the ruler to his uh, subjects and the subjects to the ruler and the rulers to the other rulers. <laughs> you, you would have in, in Iran, you would have uh, the Navruz, uh, the uh, Iranic New Year, which would also be celebrated by the Mughals. You would have the birth of a, of a male child, his circumcision, you would have victories and so on. And, and each occasion was a good occasion of exchanging gifts and weapons were uh, some of the uh, main gifts exchanged on these occasions. So, and, and, and looking at, at the, um, for instance, uh, the paintings with audience scenes, uh, you would notice that many people would carry daggers, for instance, and thinking about that these daggers may have been exchanged between the ruler and his subjects, that somehow it, it's, it gives an interesting perspective to these images somehow the, 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 the weapons became become a link between the rumor, ruler and his subjects. And you would see that, you would notice it in the painting, but also the people attending the, 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 the audience would also know that this, I'm carrying a gift from my ruler or the ruler is carrying a gift from me. So presumably these weapons would be mainly given to, from the ruler to a male subject, or would they be given rarely to females? I, I asked this question because Rachel recently posted um, this story about a warrior queen in India who fought um, very successfully against the Mughals. So this is why I'm asking whether or not these weapons would be also given to women as gifts. That's a great question. Um, I mean, they would have, I think they would have had to in some ways. Women at the royal court, um, both royalty and nobility were trained in using weapons and also in certain types of practices like archery, for example, it was considered uh, a form of both power and femininity to be able to hunt with uh, archery equipment. And some women were fortunate enough to be well-versed in using a sword or a dagger. Um, so I, I would like to say that they were given the opportunity to 
carry uh, weapons. But unfortunately, there's not much as far as primary resources that actually show this. There are some paintings that have women wielding katars or punch daggers that I have come across, but there's nothing that I have uh, seen that is written documentation of women receiving weapons as gifts. But to piggyback off of what Joachim said, these objects were, inc were very much functional. They were meant to be weapons. And, and I feel this can be said for Islamic material um, from beyond South Asia, but in South Asia, there's this wonderful feature of these objects that no detail is spared. You will find the most elaborate decoration on, on the underneath of a pommel or on the bottom of a gun. So I feel that even if hilts of edge weapons, for example, had forms or decoration that made it a little difficult to wield, that didn't stop artisans from pairing it with blades that were definitely functional. And as Joachim said, they were meant to be status symbols. They're like the equivalent of uh, a men, men wearing w fancy watches like Rolex or Patek Philippe or um, things like that. They were part of court dress. They signified their status at court. And you see the hilt uh, showing from the uh, putka or waist sash of a dagger or a sword being carried on a belt or in hand and you immediately notice that hilt that's covered in gems and gold and silver and the level of ornamentation as well. So uh, talking about fancy hilts or pommels, I want to take, take us back to that magnificent dagger that um, Joachim talked about. It's, we actually put it on the cover of the issues this, this piece. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you, you mentioned it shows a lion battling an elephant. Could you talk yes. about the origin of this motif in Hindu India and how it was adopted in the Muslim context in the Deccan? Well, yeah, I, yeah, actually you, you find this uh, battle between a lion or rather a lion dominating an elephant, you find it in Southern India in a Hindu context. And uh, then when the sultans, when the, when the uh, Islamic rulers came to southern India, they kind of adapted this, uh, adopted this uh, motif. And you also find it uh, in the, on the forts of these uh, Deccanese sultans in uh, the Deccan, uh, where, you, you, where we have it as, a, as kind of a symbol of, of uh, royal dominions. I mean, a king, a, a, a lion, is in, in many uh, countries a symbol of kingship somehow. And of course, it's also in the Iranian world, you would find it. Uh, but an elephant, on the other hand, it's uh, of course also a, a mighty animal. And somehow I think it's, it's a, the, the image, to me, it's a bit strange, but uh, that the lion can dominate the, the, the elephant. But you must think of the, the ruler riding on an elephant. That's also his way of dominating the elephant. So that's in a way how the, the image uh, makes sense at least to me. And as regards to the dagger we talked about, uh, it has uh, a particular, I think, meaning in the context with, with, the, with the Sultan of, of uh, Bijapur, Ali Adil Shah, because his namesake, Ali, uh, who is Ali Ibn uh, Talib, who is uh, one of the followers of the Prophet, one of the important persons, most important persons in, in Shiism. <clears throat> uh, he's also often compared to a lion. So this gives a particular twist to uh, the dagger, which uh, apparently belonged to uh, uh, Ali, uh, to this uh, Deccani uh, ruler. So were both uh, the painting and the dagger collected separately or at the same time by the David collection? Did you just one day? No, no, they were co collected at in di different times. Different times. And but so the dagger, uh, yeah, the, the dagger has a, a history in a range collection before we we we, uh, we managed to acquire it. While the, the painting, I mean, we we acquired in London. But did you? So, so. Did you, when you acquired the painting in London, did you know, did you think that the dagger represented was the one in your collection or did you make that discovery afterwards? 
No, no, no. I mean, uh, they, it was the painting was uh, famous before we acquired it, so, actually. So and the link the between the link between the, the the painting and the dagger has always been made. There's actually um, another painting of the same uh, Deccani uh, Sultan in the Freer and Sackler Gallery, which is a bit of a later copy, we guess, while ours is the original painting. So it's, it's kind of a, a famous subject. But, but uh, dealing with arms and daggers and so on, we, we often also like to compare to the uh, images when these daggers appear in images. And it's, it's useful not just to see the, the social context, but also to date them. For instance, there are particular daggers that only appear in uh, Mughal uh, paintings of the Jahangir period, mm -hmm. Jahangir daggers, that's a way to date them and, and so on. So, so combining daggers and when they appear in paintings, that, that's very useful. But I guess this is a quite particular um, uh, design, the dagger, so it'd be more easily recognizable, I, I feel. I mean, some of the, the, the daggers with the horse's pommel, I feel that if you saw that in a painting, I would just think it's you know, one of a hundred horse dagger, <laughs> horse pommeled, horse head pommeled daggers. Um, but no, I think it's fascinating that you have both the painting and the the um, the dagger, and it really does put it in context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then this kind of dagger was only produced in the second half of the uh, 16th century, mm -hmm. and of course the, the the hilts with horses, Indian hilts with with ending in, in horses. I mean, you you find them. I think they start in the maybe 1640s or something like that, and then they continue perhaps even up to modern times. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And they're adapted from Central Asian um, techniques and customs. So the horse head pommel has a very long history in Central Asia to Iran to South Asia. So Risha, can you elaborate on how arms and armor played a role in an even more global cultural and artistic exchange? I mean, we just talked about the horse head motif from Central Asia and how it was used in um, South, uh, South Asia. But what about the cross fertilization between um, uh, India and the West? For example, the dagger with the ivory hilt in the shape of a stag's head. Yes. Can you uh, illustrate it? Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen so I can show that um, dagger. Okay, so this is the dagger. It's one of my favorite um, works. Like other artistic genres, like painting, South Asian arms and armor de definitely demonstrates Western influences. And this dagger is such a fantastic example of that. And it's just, I could stare at this all day. It's just rendered with such beautiful detail. You have flared ears and nostrils. The mouth that's agape has individually carved teeth. And then these beautiful branch-like antlers that actually help give us a clue as to where the stag might have been influenced from. And that actually seems to be this engraving by Albrecht Dürer of St. Eustace. And you see the stag right here on the right corner with these branch-like antlers. And this is not surprising. Religious prints and drawings came to the Mughal court, including ones that were made by Dürer through Jesuit missions. And so you find this stag with branch-like antlers in not only a dagger form, but also in Mughal painting. Um, there are a couple different examples. I talk about two in my article. I'm just gonna show one right now. And it's this painting that was produced under Jahangir. And um, it features Jahangir, he's sitting right over here. And at the bottom right, you see his royal falconer and ambassador to Iran, Khan Alam, holding a, an automaton with this stag with the branch-like antlers. And you can see that blown up in this detail that I have on the left. The automaton also features the goddess Diana of the hunt. And Augsburg was a center that produced such automaton. And I believe the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the MFA Boston actually have ex examples of these automata. And it just 
proves that not only were two-dimensional materials coming from Europe to the Mughal court, but also three-dimensional materials as well. And I have no doubt that these materials definitely shaped the production of daggers such as this. You also get um, daggers that have um, hilts in the form of flowers and one um, hilt that I can think of that's also a favorite of mine. I have many favorite weapons, but one in the Harvard Art Museum's collection of an iris and that iris is modeled after ones that were created, or sorry, ones that came from England, the Netherlands and Spain. And Shah Jahan was so in, in love with those types of irises that they uh, were used repeatedly in decorative arts. And so you definitely have these Western influences creating this um, a wonderful artistic exchange. And like the Nilgai dagger, this stag has a much greater significance than demonstrating power and authority. It really helped put or help symbolize the Mughals on a global scale, that they were interacting with Europe, that they were having these interactions through trade and cultural exchange and artistic exchange. So it helped put uh, the Mughal empire kind of on the map, so to speak, that they were involved with all of these other uh, centers across the world. So I presume the exchange would be the other way as well. And would oh, you find- absolutely motifs on Western weapons? That's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't really looked at the other way, but that's that's something I definitely would love to explore, Ifan. Um, you've given me another uh, research topic to look into. So, okay, the last question would be, despite the cross-fertilization of motifs and formats, are there any examples that you can categorically assign to a certain culture or people? Yeah, um, Joachim, if you don't mind, um, could I answer for South, um, on behalf of South Asian Arms and Armor? Yeah. I'll show you some um, examples of, of that. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again. So you do definitely have um, representations of certain groups of, of people and um, communities, as well as uh, regions. And um, you can attribute these objects to very specific areas, despite the cross fertilization, which does affect um, att attributions with South Asian arms and armor to a significant extent. But luckily, there are some examples where we can identify uh, certain groups of people using materials. So for example, on if we're talking about katars, our punch daggers, on the left, we have a katar that represents arguably the earliest group of katars. They come from the uh, South Indian region slash kingdom of Vijayanagar. They were produced in the 16th century and they're characterized by these really sharp tapered blades that have deep grooves that um, mimic the shape of the blade. They have these beautiful knuckle guards that uh, feature a hooded naga or snake. And on the right, we have another katar that represents a group also from South India, from Tanjavur or Tanjore in Tamil Nadu. And these um, were produced between the 17th and 18th century and they're characterized by really elaborate knuckle guards that are pierced like here, they're chiseled, embossed, um, engraved. And interestingly enough, they are often paired with repurposed European blades. And so these are two um, great examples. Then you have objects that can be affiliated to specific tribes and communities in India. So this beautiful dagger known as a Pinchagati is uh, affiliated with the Kodovas people of Karnataka. And then with regard to armor, you definitely have some great examples. Um, so for example, the one on the far left is um, a helmet that is inspired by a turban style that was worn by the Marathas who ruled present-day Maharashtra and at the height of their uh, power controlled pretty much most of India. The one next to it is a helmet that's based on a turban style that was popular amongst the Mughals between the 17th and the 18th century. That's followed by a helmet that is inspired by a 
turban style that was worn in the Deccan during the 17th century. And then the one on the right has this raised top portion that would have been used to accommodate the Sikh top, top knot of hair. And that is based on a popular Sikh turban style from the late 18th to the 19th century. So you do have instances where you can identify um, South Asian arms and armor to particular groups or communities of people. Yuki, what about um, weapons from more of the Islamic world? Are there any types of um, weapons or motifs that you could say that only one type of people or um, kingdom or area uses them, or is it more interconnected? I would say, I mean, all, all the weapons from, from India stand out because they have these figurative uh, parts. I mean, animals as you deal with, for instance, or flowers and things like that. But the animals, you wouldn't find them in, in Turkey or in Iran, not at all. So this is particular for, for, for India. Mm -hmm. This is one, one thing. So you would, prop, so it would be more um, graphical designs on Islam. Yes, non non figurative, decorative. Uh, I mean, you would have a different kind of ornaments. You would perhaps also have, uh, I mean, inscriptions to a larger degree or um, geometrical ornaments, things like that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think um, time is up for this fascinating lecture. I feel like we can go on for another hour, but. <laughs> You know, it's late in the day and very early for Joachim and early for you, Rachel. Um, so uh, for those that have some knowledge in this area, I hope that this talk has given you greater insight. And for those that are new to this area, that this talk has been inspiring. Thank you to Joachim and Rachel for joining us today. And thank you to our audience. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.